接下来的论坛，我们则是要从五 G 还有 data 的角度来探讨未来企业的发展。那么首场专题演讲，我们就请到台山资本科技基金的合伙人吴景成，正在戏股四次创业成功。那这四家科技公司的总值是高达了一千六百亿台币。他目前也担任工研院的院士，是台美两地大家都很敬重的通信界大佬。好，我们现在已经看到 Chen 了。Hello Chen， 好啊。你好，那今天 Chen 要分享的主题是五 G 专网低轨道卫星的发展现况，还有未来趋势。好 ，Chen 现在现场交给你。好，那现在可以开始了哈。可以开始，谢谢。OK， 我要用英文讲哈，比较方便一点。OK， 好，好 ，Good morning everybody. Um, it's an honor for me to talk to you about the subject of private five G. Uh. Uh, the uh, low orbit satellite and beyond. And given that today's discussion is about enterprise, I'm going to talk about the a broader perspective of things that will probably cover the probably 5G, 6G satellite communication uh, as related to enterprise application from that perspective. So before I get started, I just want to give a little bit background for uh, what we're trying to do today. Um, from, from a Taiwanese perspective, we look at the future, first and foremost, from a disruption perspective. And then, you know, after you see an opportunity for disruption, you obviously will look for a preemptive opportunity to get into the market. So from my perspective, I think there are two, these are two major uh, uh, metrics or sticks uh, that you make a judgment in order to gauge where the industry is going. And, and from a disruption perspective, you can look at it from many different angles, uh, but, uh, but from, a, from a Taiwanese perspective and from our industry perspective, I think a lot of them are focusing on really the intersection of hardware and software. And from that perspective, I have, um, you know, uh, some perspective to share. Uh, I would say that if you focus on disruption, you really have to focus on what are becoming different and how that affects the industry as a whole. So when we look at um, across the landscape, we look at it and categorize them into a number of different areas. Uh, the first one I, I think I will talk about is the cloud infrastructure. And everybody knows that from a cloud infrastructure perspective, everybody pays their attention to the public cloud. But the reality is that the public clouds will continue to grow. And what will be actually growing faster is actually the edge cloud. And the reason edge cloud is becoming an emerging area it's because it's closer to where the consumption points are. And as they are closer to the consumption points, they possess the advantage of being able to deliver the service much faster than otherwise. And this is the reason why edge clouds becomes the, one of the most important emerging area from a disruption perspective, because it represents the opportunity to move the application and services to, to the edge the same way the application would run in the cloud. In other words, it doesn't require application to change, but you can move the application closer to where the usage is going to be. And what, what more importantly, I think, is the combination that 5G is happening at the same time. And therefore, the coupling of 5G and edge computing it's an emerging disruption. Uh, as we think about disruption, we then need to think about that um, the applications themselves are becoming container-based. And as they become distributed, they will now become distributed across multiple clouds. The issue of connecting applications across multiple clouds is a very disrupted situation because it doesn't really run over the, today's physical infrastructure well. And therefore it needs something to bring it to the next level. The same thing happened to the physical infrastructure, be it 
data center at the edge, or data center within the 5G, or data center in the cloud. And the reason for that disruption is because we cannot afford to have three different networks. 5G runs its own network, and the edge runs its own network, and cloud runs its own network. We need to look at the network as one because applications don't see them separately. And therefore, uh, there is a disruption going on at, a, at an infrastructure level, namely the need to unify 5G, edge cloud, and public clouds together. And then we have the uh, question of the 5G that when is made freely available from a spectrum usage perspective, such as what's happening in the US with CBRS, uh, we now see that the private 5G market's taking off very quickly. And that's a disruption because in the past, there wasn't such a thing that the spectrum for cellular is free. So you look at the smart enterprise then, I would also divide it up into three different disruptions. One is that we all know about data lakes and we all know about data warehouses. And we know that we're consuming a lot more data and we're, we're generating more data. And the speed of data that's being generated is faster than the speed of computation that we can afford to process them. So at a fundamental level, we know data is growing faster than our ability to consume them. That's a disruption. Uh, the ability to consume data is well understood. The ability to protect data when you consume it is not. And so we think that in the general space of data analytics, uh, data warehouses and data lakes, uh, one emerging area that actually is somewhat overlooked is the whole space of data security as a seamless insertion to data analytics. Then further, I think there is a question of the, the, our ability to consume data is tied to our ability to use the tool and the speed that we can use the tool to analyze the data. And that really falls into the space of how do we evolve today's software tools in such a way that um, the data migration and data integration services can be as near no code as possible. And beyond that, uh, what's happening also is that um, most data that we traditionally run on premise now are migrating to the cloud which is undisputable fact. Um, the issue then is that when you run in the cloud, you no longer have the control of the hardware that you used to have on premise. And therefore it creates a whole bunch of issues that when you need hardware acceleration, how do you accelerate data in a public cloud? And that's a disruption. So that's, uh, those are the three different angles that we share uh, when we talk about smart enterprises, at least from Taiwanese perspective. Now we know for a long time, materials are the mother of all innovation. Uh, manufacturing process, packaging, uh, also create new technologies. Uh, we know materials uh, make a lot of impact in airplanes such as uh, car, you know, carbon fiber. Um, and there are, we know that new materials such as, as even um, at a quantum level um, could affect different quantum computers to be created. Uh, but in the process of seeing new material and processes, um, one area that's um, uh, exciting, extremely exciting is actually the potential of uh, creating computer from the ground up again to get into quantum computing. And that particular area, uh, it's very interesting because it involves a lot of hardware level and even subatomic level innovation. Uh, but it fits 
into the boundary between hardware and software, and therefore one of the fundamental strengths for Taiwan. And, and, and lastly, but not least, the, in a the smart healthcare space, uh, obviously we talk about remote healthcare a lot, but, but I would say that there are a number of areas which are quite groundbreaking. Uh, one is really more in the, um, uh, the in-body scope, uh, using the narrow robotics technologies. And when you use that kind of technology, you actually tie it to a lot of things that we are accustomed to in enterprise today. You know, for example, the ability to use AR, VR technologies, uh, the ability to do self-guiding of the cable within your body, the, the ability to tie that in a camera together to be able to precisely locate where you are in the body. Uh, and those technologies are fundamentally impacting and fundamental to our strength. And the other area I would say, um, you know, inevitably is in AI. But, but, but the area that in AI that, that affects healthcare in the most significant way, perhaps is the attempt to understand biosignatures that, that, would, that would be used from a biology perspective and disease and drug discovery perspective and crossing them at the same time. And so you can see that disruption is plenty and it cuts across many different disciplines at the same time. Now, um, I said that um, though disruption is important, uh, the ability to preempt a market to take advantage of that disruption is equally important. And this, a lot of time, it amounts to the ability for us to see a disruption is occurring and the ability to assemble a team and with a vision to execute it. And, 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 and quite often, it's also a question of correlation because I think when we do investment or uh, we'll focus on areas, we like to talk about the fact that if it wouldn't it be nice to be able to do it uh, with the situation that one plus one equals three, and would it be even better that one plus one equal infinity? Well, I think this is a case, there's a case here um, that is yet to be proven, but it's a practice that has been put in execution uh, that's, that's worth sharing. So the, here we are, there are three different companies which were created from the ground up by Taiwania each focusing on a complementary space, where Avesha focuses on what I call earlier, the ability for cloud application in a multi-cloud setting to interconnect with each other from anywhere to anywhere over any network, and all become aware of the application that are constructed based on container, it doesn't matter where you are in, in a particular data center. It doesn't matter what addresses that you use. They are interconnected and optimized securely. And then you have the three nets.io that focuses on really the mission of creating a universal data network that understand application, that understand 5G, that understand edge, and that understand cloud is a unifier for all networks. Then you have a tire land, which instead of doing another 5G that's based on public cloud or public 5G infrastructure, it attempts to try to move forward with a vision that private 5G can be as ubiquitous as Wi-Fi today. And that it will be the first time that networks are used as simple as Wi-Fi is used today. So that's an example of how the three pieces are put together. If we were to run a VESA over a tire land, 
you will create a private 5G network that's service aware and application aware. You will, you will put a base out over StreetNet, you will create a network infrastructure that uniquely understand applications. If we were to use StreetNet in isolation, it would serve to unify the network without anybody's help. So with that in mind, I wanna talk a bit about the major tech landscape. Now, one thing that's important to not forget is the 5G and NDO satellite together really make up the ability for the new space communication to go back to the Earth through 5G. And so the relation between them is such that one is in the space, one is in between, and then connect the space communication to terrestrial communications. This is the reason you cannot look at them in separation. Uh, the other thing that's very important is that the ability for public cloud and edge to collaborate, as opposed to public cloud being the, the only dominant force, is very important for 5G to work. Because without edge computing, all the 5G traffic would have been uh, funneled to the cloud infrastructure, which would not address the latency issue that's most critical to 5G services. And then you've got to look at also that traditionally we have the notion that the 5G is supposed to be just a license spectrum and services should be controlled only by the operators. Well, some people disagree with that. The US has done a tremendous job to make CPRs, CPRS, a spectrum that can be shared and shared by anybody who would pay to use it. And we have seen in the past 12 months a extreme rise of the usage of CPRS applications across different industries. So what this really tell us is that once you make something so common, it creates a new industry for us. If we put private, if we put 5G in a, on a wall garden, it's not going to create a new industry. But if you combine private 5G and CPRS together, and you make it easy for anybody to use, anybody who knows how to use Wi-Fi know how to use it, what would be the reason that it doesn't take off? So that's the reason that I think a project like this is started. But after saying that, it's important to point out that what you try to do by unifying all the networks together to make it simple, still lies with the need for system integrator on top to make things easy so that they can run over. So, so these are the major things that are happening in terms of technology, as well as um, the, uh, the changes in the ecosystem to be the catalyst to get a new industry going. Um, a lot of time, we don't think 5G and metaverse are connected, but they are. You now, one thing about metaverse is that the foundation of metaverse is decentralization. And one thing about 5G is that all services shall be decentralized. And so it is the foundation to enable services to be distributed. Now, granted, you need to run blockchain over them, but at the infrastructure level, decentralization is the key. Um, the other thing that's also related to 5G is that you need a data center to be distributed too, uh, because it doesn't scale to be centralized. You need to follow the principle of decentralization. And the only way you can decentralize it is that you build a lot of smaller data centers, and we call them edge data centers. Um, if you have any doubt whether or not this is the trend, 
uh, this, the market has shown that by 2025, the market for edge computing is going to grow from 1% to 30%. Now, having said that, the cloud data center will grow to about 45%, but it would be growing from a much higher base. Now, just think about this just for a second. You want to spend all the time building more advancement in AR, VR, and MR. You want to live in the metaverse world, but all these are dependent upon the infrastructure being able to support it. And for the games that you really like, uh, they are moving from console games to cloud gaming as well. And just think about it just for a second. When you move it to cloud gaming, in order for you to access the games as quickly as possible with low latency, those games and game instances need to be placed closer to where you play it. And that's called edge computing. But in order to do it as quickly as possible, not having an Ethernet wire, you will need 5G. And so that's the combination of 5G and Metaverse together. Um, so we have talked quite a bit about uh, low Earth orbit satellites and um, a, a lot of countries in the world have um, you know, set their sight on this emerging market. And there's a, there's a good reason for it, right? Because um, unlike the traditional satellites, which, which, which are bulky, uh, what you're doing, really now talking about are smaller satellites and, and lower orbit. And they're, 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 uh, they're tied together into a constellation which means that you don't think of them to be uh, individual satellites doing discrete functions. You mean to say they are tied together to form what we call a space internet. Now, the space internet is not here to replace the internet that we know, but it serves to complement it. And that when you look at that, you say, well, you know, what's so different about the uh, deal uh, communication or space communication, that's different from what we know today as 5G. Well, I think it would, uh, at a semiconductor level and the material level, it's going to trigger a new evolution uh, toward high frequency, high power efficiency, uh, and high power IC development uh, that's not otherwise available today. Uh, because you're talking about, uh, you know, frequency up to tens of gigabits level, all the, way to, all the way up to hundreds of gigabits level, gigahertz level, I'm sorry. And then, um, so we call that a space sub terahertz. And that's very different because it's one order of magnitude higher or two order of magnitude higher from a frequency perspective. But um, not everybody can be in the satellite business and not all the businesses derive from the satellite because you can make a lot of money out of the ground station. It can make a lot of money out of applications. So when we think of low Earth orbit satellites, we should not think of it to be hardware. The hardware is to enable software and data services. And that Combining them together is what we need to do. But every country, especially from Taiwan perspective, perhaps would more focus on the ground station and interconnect and all the components that are needed to make it happen. Because after all, we are the hub for worldwide supply chains. Then we got to look into um, how do we move traffic coming down from space to the rest of the world. Well, that's 5G. So that's what we talked about earlier. So we're not trying to say, uh, when we talk about 6G or low Earth orbit satellites, 5G is the past. What we're talking about is the 5G is a linchpin 
especially from a private private 5G perspective, to invigorate a new generation of 5G services that's wireless. We also think that the 5G would serve as a linchpin to tie space communication down to the Earth. Um, so, so in summary, I think what we need to think about is that we need to think about space communication, cloud communication, 5G and data center all together as one gigantic ecosystem that we're trying to build. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the uh, 5G and and DO communication. What would be the synergy between them? The first we need to think about is that, you know, when you have space communication coming down, you know, it, it, the strength of it is that you see the entire world. As the Earth rotates, it rotates. And so it sees the footprint of the entire, entire world. And therefore, it's extremely powerful from a global communication perspective, especially in areas where we have difficulty having internet access. And so in a sense, 5G and dense populated areas um, are complementary to space communication from the space coming down. And so they, they, they are designed to complement each other and not to kill each other. Um, the, the satellite ground stations really is, has a lot of complexity in it because it has to serve the function of communicating with space and serve the a function of communicating with the rest on the ground. And then it has to deal with the issue of many uh, uh, you know, high uh, frequency bands uh, that need to perhaps coexist together. Uh, you know, where we started from was the Q band, which is most popular, and that will present where the industry is today. But in terms of power efficiency and the bandwidth efficiency, the KA band in the range of 26 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz is actually more effective. Then we got to ask ourselves, when we try to get into the space communication industry, can we focus on one or do we need to focus on both? And the reason this issue is brought up a lot of times is because it takes a lot of money to do both. And, and this is uh, an area where we got to really think about it and say, if this is an area that we place a lot of emphasis and hope that we can beat in the future, then we got to set the assumption correctly. The assumption is not that the QE band would be sufficient alone. The assumption is that QU and KA band need to be in deployment together at the same time. Uh, but having said that, I would also say that space communication today is an open field for competition. It means anybody who put their sight on it with focus, they have a chance to win. And so, so in order to win though, it's important to also point out that what we talk about for high frequency areas for RF and for ICs, actually a lot of time are export restricted. And so in order for you to win a market like that, you actually have to have higher degree of control. Without higher degree of control, uh, despite all the efforts, you may not be able to control the ecosystem. So in summary, I would just say a couple more things to kind of sum up what we talk about. Uh, I would say first, uh, you know, 5G and edge clouds together, uh, it's important for us to use it to connect to the, the Leo satellites. Uh, because without it, the Leo actually serves the rural areas where 5G and edge actually have most presence. Uh, so that they need to come together. 
Uh, the second point I want to uh, re-emphasize a bit is that 5G services, 5G has actually caught a lot of attention by people, but most people have not realized that they need a, a sibling called Edge Data Center to, to be coupled with. Um, a lot of time we don't see that, especially in a smaller territory like Taiwan, because it doesn't really make a lot of difference whether or not you have an edge data center in the south and a, and a north, one each, and you don't need a lot of them. But in a continent like US and China and EU, um, without edge data center, it's just simply not going to work. And so, you know, if we have that export mindset, uh, we need to tie 5G and edge data centers together because that will be the only way that you can scale that particular ecosystem. The third point I want to point out is that though today we talk quite a bit about network 4G, 5G, and satellite communications, the days that networks are not application aware are gone. It does not make sense for the network to be built without understanding application traffic. So that's one. And second, application interconnect is no longer a single, single data center issue because applications are now distributed across many, many locations and across many, many continents and across many multiple clouds. So application connect, interconnect has become a multi-cloud concern. That's a, that's a new problem. You know, it's, it's very tough to run over them, run over multiple clouds, because you run over many different networks. And, and so you need to be able to see them to be one unified network. And for that reason, 5G and edge cloud and public cloud must be unified for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Chen.